Hello, everyone, and welcome to Capron Asia's 2021 Asia Pacific FinTech Trends. This is the 10th year we've actually been doing these trends reports, and I think this year more than any other is one of the most critical years that we've seen in the FinTech industry. Certainly 2020 set a new paradigm, both for the way that individuals and businesses across the region handle their finances and how they're looking forward into the future. Uh, 2021, as we start to come out of the pandemic and lockdown across the Asia region, will redefine what it means um, to be a participant in the economies across the region. FinTech will play a critical role in that. Although it's difficult to uh, pull out 10 specific trends around what's happening in the industry, what we're attempting to do today is give you an idea of what we're seeing in the market and what we're looking for in 2021. Joining me on today are uh, some of the some of uh, the Capron Asia team from around the region. We have Joshua Chong, who's here in Capron Asia in Singapore. We have Lele Wong, who's joining us from our Shanghai office, and Matt Fulco, who's joining us from Taipei. Uh, over the course of the next 60 minutes, we'll be taking a look at what we see as the top trends within the region. Uh, hopefully, we'll get through all 10, but we'll get through as many as we can. Uh, we are open for Q&A, so if you have questions as we go through, please do ask them in the functionality in the Q&A section within Zoom. This webinar is also tied into the 2020 Top 10 Trends Report, or 2021 Top 10 Trends Report that we'll be publishing within the next week. Uh, we will be sharing information about how to download that report at the end of the webinar and for anybody who's attended the webinar itself. Uh, for many of you, you know what we do and who we are at Capron Asia, but just very briefly to give you an intro, uh, we are a market research and consulting company focused on the financial industry in Asia. We have offices here in Singapore where I'm based, Shanghai, as well as representation with Matt in Taipei and Korea, Japan. Our focus is helping financial institutions, fintechs, and other market participants understand what's happening across banking, payments, capital markets, and increasingly cryptocurrency and fintech in general. Uh, as I mentioned before, every year we've done this report for the past decade, and it continues to be one of our more popular reports. For this year, when we break down the uh, top 10 trends that we've identified, uh, this is basically what we're looking at. And I won't go through each one of these. We'll go through individually as, as, um, as throughout the rest of this webinar. But fundamentally, you know, I think a lot of these could be driven by the fact uh, of the pandemic and the challenges that we faced in 2020. Uh, increased digitization across the region uh, accelerated. Uh, this was a trend that we were already seeing in 2018, 2019, 2020, but only accelerated during the pandemic times. Uh, when you look across the region and you look at SMEs in places like Indonesia, India, and even here in Singapore, many were struggling with the pandemic and how to reach customers and how to handle their finances, which is driving this digitization across the region. So if we could look at one overarching theme that really is digitization across the region. One of the key trends in that is the first trend actually that we have for the webinar today, and that's looking at the competition among mobile payment and e-wallet providers in Asia. So for this, let me pass it over to Joshua to go through. Thank you, thank you, Zenon. So one of our main observations is that the e-wallet race is still wide open in Asia. Uh, we definitely have leaders such as Grab and Gojek. Um, however, we can see that the balance of power is shifting. We have um, C or Shopee, which is owned by C, um, launching a, and one of their e-wallets as well. Um, and I think some of some of our conclusions from this is that there's going to be an impact on, on the smaller e-wallet players, as a lot of them will have a much um, struggle to survive in this new landscape. So we believe that this will lead to a lot more partnerships being formed. Um, some of these smaller players um, have carved out a niche in, let's say, the MS targeting MSMEs, micro small merchants, um, and these uh, these small e-wallets can thus uh, give a, a strong value proposition to be, let's say, merged or um, partnered with uh, with a Grab or Gojek for instance. Um, the second thing that we observe that's happening with a lot of the e-wallets is they're starting to make e-payment integration for merchants because they realize that the, the only way that they can bring more of these uh, merchants onto their platform is to make it attractive and um, in a sense convenient for the merchants to, to use their e-payments. Um, so this has, we have seen a lot of features such as instant settlement um, from Paytm and all of this helps um, makes this e-wallet option more attractive for merchants. Uh, finally, on top of that, the e-wallets are also bundling services. We have this idea of a, a super platform and this is definitely the case where um, 
additional financial services such as buy now, pay later, um, or even like retail investment management are being added on, on top of the regular payment services, um, just to create a more comprehensive ecosystem uh, for users. That's great. Thanks, Joshua. I mean, it, it, when we look at the competitive landscape, do you think there is space for pure play digital wallet players to survive in the market? So I think from our from our observations, uh, the pure play e-wallet is no longer a sustainable business model. A lot of these um, smaller e-wallets were thriving on the fact that they could use um, cashbacks and discounts to bring on customers. Um, however, as as consumers realize that you know they are limited with the smaller e-wallets, they don't have the same level of functionality and additional features. A lot of them are no longer um, using it as much, so user retention has dropped a lot for the smaller e-wallets. Um, so definitely, they'll have to look for ways to either build and add on services on their own, or partner with other um, wallets with more comprehensive services. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense and that kind of matches up with a lot of the research that we're seeing. Um, another question that, that has come in from um, the audience here. Uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to kind of think through this, Joshua, but what's your take on the Grab Gojek merger oh, rumors? Yeah, this this is a, one of the big topics to keep hearing rumors every few days. Um, I think Matt, Matt has a, a more in-depth look at it, but I'll give my quick take is I, I don't think it's going to be, a, I don't think it's going to happen um, partly because there's just uh, too much of a, uh, um, uh, there's too much in between these two companies in the sense of uh, competition, competition rules, as well as the, the large number of investors they have. So trying to get investors on both sides to be aligned and to get past the competition authorities, I think that's going to be too much of a challenge. But I think Matt can elaborate further on this. Great. Thanks, Rashwa. Yeah. And that's a... Um... Uh, yeah, I think that's one of the key topics and we're seeing already around the uh, Tokipedia as well uh, is really changing the nature of the, the landscape around what potentially could happen in Southeast Asia around some of these mergers. That's a great segue into our second trend and uh, I want to go over to Matt on this one. I mean, fintech fundraising. Uh, Matt, talk us through what are some of the changes that we'll be seeing across Asia when we look at fundraising within the fintech space in 2021? Uh, thank you, Zenin. So uh, in recent years, uh, India and, and China, just by the sheer size of their, of their markets, have attracted a huge amount of fintech funding. Um, and that's been pretty consistent in the past few years. However, uh, in, in 2021, we're going to see a significant change in the, in, because from a regulatory standpoint, uh, both China and India will be less friendly uh, to fintech investment. So looking at China, uh, there's a fintech crackdown that's begun, um, you know, that begun a few years ago, but that really uh, kicked up a notch with uh, the mixing of Ant Group's IPO. Uh, and what that means is that fintechs are going to increasingly be regulated like banks. Uh, they're not going to have the same growth prospects. Uh, their margins will be pinched. Uh, in that kind of a regulatory environment uh, going public, especially with what's happened to Ant for other Chinese fintechs, um, JD Digits, the fintech unit of uh, JD.com, was planning an IPO in the fall of 2020. Um, that's, that's been put off indefinitely. Uh, Ant, Ant Group's IPO has been postponed indefinitely. So for as long as that crackdown is going on in China, there's going to be a chill uh, in funding for fintechs in China. Looking at India, uh, it's still quite a dynamic environment. Uh, there's strong demand for digibanking services. Uh, fierce competition, uh, but for foreign tech giants who've so far played a, an enormous role in developing the fintech sector in India, uh, it's becoming less friendly. Uh, and whether you're American or you're Chinese or otherwise, uh, in 2021, you'll find that it is no longer as welcoming as it was before. Uh, we already saw in 2020, uh, fi uh, finally, WhatsApp Pay was able to launch, but only to a small portion. I think it was about 5% of all of its users in India, and it has um, you know, a huge number, three, three hundred, more than 400 million, and still only a, a small number of those users uh, currently have access under the formal launch. Um, so what we might see, in, in what we expect to see in India in the future is more, more uh, tie-ups between those uh, foreign, the foreign fintech giants and or foreign tech giants rather and, and local firms to sort of gain a strong foothold in that market. 
looking at Southeast Asia, uh, Singapore and India uh, are expected to be uh, the hotspots for fintech funding in 2021. Uh, Singapore has attracted about about 40 percent of uh, the Southeast Asia fintechs are, are based in Singapore already. It's attracted a, a huge amount of funding, uh, certainly in recent years, and the rate from the regulatory environment or uh, the ability to raise capital, uh, the ecosystem, the geographic positioning, um, Singapore is, is strengthening and cementing its position as the key fintech hub in Southeast Asia. Um, looking at, at Indonesia, that's a very different market. Um, it's a huge market, the, the third largest um, by population after uh, China and India in Southeast Asia. And that is going to be a focus for investors, uh, both from China, uh, the U.S., and otherwise in 2021, uh, given that China's environment and India's environment are no longer as uh, hospitable. Um, Interesting. Yeah, I think this is uh, when we look at fintech, fin, fintech fundraising and and M and A just in general. I'd, uh, I don't know, Matt, if you had seen this morning, but one of the big pieces of news was the the Visa Plaid uh, acquisition being called off, and so Plaid will continue to kind of go it alone. Uh, and, and a lot of that, I mean, it publicly was a bit down to regulatory challenges because it, it, it turned out to be a much longer process to get that acquisition approved. So it slowed down. So it's, it's, it's still in, instructive to see, you know, how, how regulation plays a part in this. I mean, going back to the question, maybe we can start off with a grab Gojek question uh, that, that was posed to, um, to Josh. I mean, what, what's your take on that? Do you, do you think that there are legs for that? within Southeast Asia? Uh, so I think that the, the, there are a few fundamental uh, challenges with the Grab Gojek merger. Uh, one of those is the redundancy of, of the services. So the argument behind it is they'd be stronger together if they, if they put their ride hailing and their food delivery and of course uh, their, their FinTech services together, but there's also a redundancy there um, that I don't think, it, by putting those services together, they necessarily will be stronger than C Group. Uh, C Group has an ecosystem that's stickier. Uh, you, you have gaming and you have e-commerce in there, uh, which obviously we've seen Shopee surging in Indonesia. And uh, I don't think that by putting the uh, Grab and Gojex platforms together that you'll necessarily have something that's stronger uh, than, than what Shopee has at the moment. The, the other possibility that we've heard about in recent, uh, and, and the other issue from, from a regulatory standpoint is antitrust. Uh, Indonesia, while still being friendlier, uh, certainly to outside investors uh, than, than India or China, is, would be wary of, um, they would, certainly Indonesian regulators would be wary of uh, Grab having such a, a dominant position uh, in the Indonesian market, especially as it's already dominant uh, elsewhere. Uh, in Southeast Asia, that wouldn't necessarily be better for consumers if, if or, or businesses if they're merchants if there's a monopoly. Uh, and finally, there's an issue with um, with workers in Indonesia who are concerned about what would happen to them. Um, you know, ride hailing from from the drivers and, and then also those uh, delivering food, so drivers of vehicles, um, they'd be concerned what would happen in the event of a, a Grab Gojek merger with their with their employment. Mm. Yeah, so that's a good point. From, the, from all those yeah. viewpoints, as well as investors uh, questioning how profitable it would be. So there's, there's a, yep. as you mentioned. So I think there are a lot of roadblocks in the way of that. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. I mean, it's um, a, a lot of overlapping services on that. So it's a bit unclear exactly how that will be, how that will play out. Um, uh, another question came in from the audience here, um, going back to China and Ant's IPO. Um, the question is from Helen, uh, how can you predict that Ant's IPO would not be approved in short term? Um, if they're satisfying all of the regulators' requirements, uh, why would the, the IPO not go forward? Uh, Matt, do you, have any, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, from what we've seen so far, uh, the situation for Ant, uh, looks to be quite challenging. And uh, given, given the, the politics at play here in China, uh, the idea that Ant's IPO would be fast-tracked, um, you know, doesn't look feasible at this moment. Um, we have to really look and see what, what kind of signals we're getting from regulators. And what we've been getting 
up until now is that Ant needs to return to its roots in payments. It needs to satisfy new capitalization requirements. Um, it needs to do a number of things. Uh, of course, if all those were approved um, expeditiously, uh, then, then perhaps an IPO could go forward. But then of course, the question is what kind of valuation you're gonna be looking at when profit margins are not what they were under the old business model. Uh, but we'd be hesitant to, to say that the IPO will, will happen in the short term, given the, the regulatory environment at the moment. But certainly, um, if we start to hear from Chinese regulators that Ant's on the right track and that it has satisfied all requirements, then we could start thinking about an IPO, but not until, not until then. Yeah, yeah, it's a very complex situation, I think. The, the, the actual regulatory requirements are only part of the whole story and, and kind of what to expect. Great, thanks, Matt. Um, staying on the topic of China and in particular uh, Ant Group, uh, Lele, I wanna come over to you. And, and I remember you and I experienced this for the first time uh, a number of years ago when we were visiting Ant Financial in Hangzhou. Uh, facial recognition payment. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about what this is and, and what it means for the future in 2021? Sure, thanks, Anna. So facial recognition technology has been used in many situations in China, actually. For example, in the public sector, the government would take the information and use that as ID verification. Like in most of the transport stations in China, people can just scan their face and get past, which improved the efficiency. And in some campers and uh, big events for security reasons, the facial recognition technology is also adopted. In another part, the commercial sector, not just like people use a facial recognition to unlock their phones in their daily lives, but also like bankings are inserting, bankings also, uh, banks also insert such functions into their apps to make everything more secure and uh, uh, more efficient. For example, the DBS, uh, app in Singapore and also most of the apps, bank apps in China has adopted facial recognition when people try to make payments or transfer. Um, so this in these situations, actually, there's one characteristic that people use facial recognition in a relatively private situation. Um, like nobody else could look into my phone if I do this facial payment. But the uh, providers of facial recognition payments, such as Alipay and WeChat Pay, they provided the market with a post machine that uses facial recognition payments with the aim to make all the payments and transactions seamless. For example, as we can see from this picture, that's what we experienced in Hangzhou when the first uh, uh, facial recognition uh, machine was used in a KFC store. I just scanned my face and connected to my Alipay. After I made the order, I clicked on payment and it's all done. I don't have to use uh, my phone to show the QR code or anything else. This is fun and interesting and also a, a like new story for these providers to, to tell the public and the investors. However, in 2020, the, uh, the COVID thing just slowed everything down. People wear a mask everywhere. So it did not really help the promotion of this payment in the public area. When the thing's getting easier and now the Alipay and WeChat Pay are actually reinvesting like tens of billions RMB, trying to market this new technology now, they are in, very enthusiastic, not just because this is a new interesting story, and also because this to them could potentially solve some pain points in the business. In the business, for example, what if people forget to bring their phone or their phone just goes out of the battery, nobody can make the payment, but with the face, people can just make all the deals in a second. That's what they claim to be the benefits of facial recognition payment in the retail market. However, there are two other very important parts, parties in the whole business chain, the merchants and the customers. For merchants, why would they spend 200 to 300 US dollars to replace or install a new post machine while their existing post machine can already 
deal with the QR payment and all different bank card payments. It's just a cost to the, it's, it's extra cost to their business. To customers, there are more reasons that they need to worry about facial recognition payment. They are worried about taking a photo in the public if they get shy and everyone else can see it. And also the more, more important thing is what about the data security? They, people are worried about who would hold those photos and where are they stored? Where would these photos be used? And as it's just unique, what if someone else get this information and conduct criminals? These worries are not coming from nowhere as there were already cases that criminals just stole or bought illegal uh, database and they generate 3D image from all those special photos, they use these 3D images to uh, apply for loans and set up different payment account online. They get the money and leaving all the debt to the information hold, uh, original holder. So all those concerns are not solved yet and uh, the cost to the merchants is clear there. So if, even if in the, uh, at this stage and in the short future, the providers would continue their efforts to promote this technology in public uh, retail payment area. The uh, concerns and the worries from co consumers and merchants make it a long way to really make facial payments popular in China. Thanks. Yeah, and that, that's really interesting. I mean, I, I remember when we we first tried this technology at, at KFC, I think it was only open to Chinese nationals. So you were the one to test it out. And I, I remember just feeling uncomfortable about the idea of a machine taking a photo of my face. And I think, you know, Alipay and Ant Group did a lot to promote this technology, but, you know, the application, as you said, in kind of public settings is potentially a little bit limited. I mean, if I think about the use case of, um, you know, if, if all of a sudden my phone runs out of batteries or I lose my phone, my, my, my first concern is not buying fried chicken necessarily. It's, it's kind of replacing the battery on my phone. So I, I'd be a little bit concerned with that. And then, you know, it, it's a good point. You know, the, it, when here, here in Singapore, as an example, I mean, you can use your phone to pay on the, the metro. And, and so my phone uses a fingerprint. Uh, technology and so I can just unlock it with my fingerprint. Uh, but my wife's phone is is an iPhone that you know the the most recent iteration gave did away with fingerprint and now is only facial recognition. But of course you can't use that with a mask, so she needs to unlock and put a code in, which is less convenient. Uh, so to a certain extent, the market is is working against facial recognition as well in that perspective. Um, Lele, I mean, what does what does this mean for biometrics in general? I mean, you kind of separated the the private versus the public scenarios. I mean, we use it in private for onboarding and KYC cases, and then public could be kind of limited. But what about other forms of biometrics like like fingerprints? I mean, is that continuing in China? What do we see in 2021 for those other forms of biometric uh, authentication? and use cases. Yeah, as you just mentioned, that fingerprint is actually a very convenient way to make payment or unlock your phone. So it's also just convenient and mostly adopted by Chinese here. Fingerprint is different from the facial recognition payment as fingerprint is the information is stored in your phone and it's difficult to du duplicate the information or get it stolen. However, the facial recognition has been proved that if the pr data protection is not good enough, the image might, be, may, uh, may get leaked and others may take advantage of them to conduct criminals. So my thinking is fingerprint would continue going as we still hold a smartphone and it is convenient and relatively more secure. But for facial recognition, it would be a different story. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, a lot of people don't put China and customer data protection in the same bucket when they talk about these things. But increasingly, over the past couple of years, the regulation around uh, customer data protection in China has increased dramatically uh, to the benefit of, of the consumers who, who didn't necessarily have those protections before. Great. Thank you, Lele. Um, 
Our next topic is looking at the incumbent banks. Um, you know, I think when we look across the region, we had uh, the virtual banks. I mean, we're a key part of the storyline in 2020. Matt, I want to come back to you uh, to talk about a little bit about what's happening both with the virtual banks and then with the traditional incumbent banks um, in, in fighting these virtual banks. Uh, thank you, Zenon. So the two, the two, the two financial centers of, of uh, Asia are really where most of the action is when it comes to virtual digital neo banks, uh, different terms for them, um, banks that operate only online. Uh, so in Hong Kong, what we've seen is that in 2020 now, all or in, in 2020, all of the digital banks did eventually uh, go online. And in order to attract customers, they offered very high interest rates. Um, they really pushed their 24 seven digital service uh, and emphasize the difference between what they're offering and traditional high fees and customer service that was not always up to customer standards at in incumbent banks. Uh, I think if you look at Hong Kong, it's interesting because uh, there's so many of these uh, virtual banks that, that have come online, but in terms of what exactly they're offering that, that's better than uh, incumbents, that, that remains to be seen. Uh, however, incumbents did face a challenge that those in Singapore did not in that the digital banks were online at, at COVID when Hong Kong was in economic recession, um, while in Singapore's case, they were only approved in December. Uh, so because the virtual bank process started a little earlier in Hong Kong, uh, we've seen incumbent banks there start to fight back a little bit earlier. So uh, certainly for HSBC, uh, one of Hong Kong's largest uh, players. Uh, they reduced fees starting in 2019. And uh, in fact, in, uh, very recently, they eliminated fees on 26 general banking and transaction services for 4 million customers uh, in Hong Kong. And that was in their, uh, they, they officially that was due to uh, COVID-19 and the effect that was having on customers, uh, but certainly uh, the, against the backdrop of digital banks coming online and highlighting the fact that uh, they're offering contactless payments and uh, minimal, minimal contact, face-to-face -face contact at a time when people are, are avoiding that uh, due to public health concerns and, and regulations. Um, so for those banks that, that can uh, afford to make those kind of investments, uh, incumbent banks such as HSBC and others in Singapore, the challenge from digital banks perhaps is, is um, not, not something to be so concerned about, but certainly something good that can, that can increase competition in the market. Uh, if we look at Singapore, uh, their, their incumbent banks had an opportunity in 2020 uh, to fast track digitization uh, while the digital banks were still waiting to be approved. Uh, so we saw that with uh, DBS, with um, certainly with UOB and, and OCBC, in fact, um, earlier in, in 2020, actually for the first time brought all their wealth advisory services online and out of necessity. And they found that uh, certainly it was, it was certainly workable and, and the direction they're gonna take that business in the future. So I think regardless of, um, how much pressure the, the incumbents face from the challengers, the direction for banking is increasingly online. One thing we need to keep in mind uh, as we're looking at this competition shaping up is that incumbent banks still benefit enormously from trust. Digital banks uh, have, have, have advanced technology, although they don't have a, a, a monopoly on that as, as DBS has reminded us. However, if you look at Grab, uh, certainly Grab has a now and Singtel have a bank in uh, Singapore that will that will go into that will uh, be online eventually, but that will be uh, in trial in in twenty in twenty twenty one. But Grab has had a number of data breaches uh, in recent years for which the MAS has fined it, uh, and that's that's something that has to be taken into consideration uh, when we're looking at all the hype around digital banks and customers switching over. Um, if you look at Ant Group, uh, 
They obviously had a strong business model in, in China for lending, and they're focused on SME lending in Singapore, and they did indeed win the license, uh, but they're experiencing regulatory problems in, in China that are affecting their business model significantly. So you have to think about if customers have a choice between Ant and, and either traditional banks or other digital banks, are they going to pick the bank that appears to have serious trouble uh, in its home market. And then finally, uh, we do need to look at smaller incumbent banks without the resources of the big guys. Those are the ones who, who are most vulnerable to disruption by digital banks, simply because the value proposition there may not be so compelling if, if the digital banks can offer uh, favorable rates to SMEs who are underserved. So, yeah. Certainly smaller incumbents do need to think about how to fend off this challenge from the digital upstarts as well, as well as the larger one, the larger banks who've already started that process. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. I mean, all, along those lines, Matt, we're getting a bunch of questions on this one. It must be one of our more popular topics thus far anyways. Um, one, of the, one of the questions is around the sustainability of some of the competitive um, uh, products that some of these banks are putting in place. So, I mean, if we look at uh, Hong Kong as an example, I mean, we've seen various banks offering limited time, but, you know, high interest up to 6% deposits. So you can put up to 25,000, I think it was 25,000 Hong Kong or US away and get 6% for a number of months. Uh, we've seen others kind of go with fee-free banking as a, as a trial or as a carrot to bring people in. Um, one of the challenges in that is, you know, how long can you subsidize your products and services? And what what's your thinking on what these banks, um, I mean, maybe just let's just look at Hong Kong as an example. What's your thinking on how these digital banks are going to be successful? I mean, what do they need to, what are the key things they need to hit to be successful going forward? So in, in, you've got eight, eight virtual banks uh, in, in Hong Kong, and many of them, of course, are linked um, you know, to Chinese, uh, Chinese banks or Chinese tech giants because they're feeding into the, you know, in the future, the, the greater Bay Area and, and looking at, it, at that, which is a huge market. Uh, I think that when you're looking at these uh, uh, digital banks, their first, their, their first goal is to try to onboard customers as soon as possible, as quickly as possible to build up some scale, to build up that deposit base. So you, you have, uh, as you mentioned, Zen, in these high, high interest rates um, you know, for a temporary period of time, I think ZA Bank offered 6.5%, but only to the first, uh, it might've been the first 50 customers, just, just something to kind of generate attention. Um, we had WeLab, uh, of course, which uh, initially offered 8% cash back um, uh, up to a certain amount uh, for, for transactions. Uh, this, this sort of um, strategy is great for marketing and to, and to generate a buzz around your bank, but it's obviously not sustainable from a, from a fiscal standpoint. So the, the digital banks need to look at serving segments of the market that are historically underserved, so I think obviously SMEs in, in Singapore and Hong Kong are certainly one, one segment where, there, where there's opportunity to, uh, to challenge the incumbents. And then obviously we hear a lot about millennials and, and, and younger people, um, but the question really is, are those people going to put, make a digital bank their primary source where they, where they put most of their money? Um, you know, the, the, if, if digital banks are able to become a primary account for, for retail bank users uh, in Hong Kong and Singapore and have their sal if salaries can be paid into there, uh, you know, that, that, would, that would be significant. But it won't be easy when you have banks uh, you know, such as DBS, uh, OCBC, UOB, which are digitally adroit and you're conscious of this challenge and have customer trust. And similarly, yep. banks such as HSBC in Hong Kong that enjoy a similar level of customer trust and are, are digitally savvy. 
Yeah, and I, I think that salary point is 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 a really good point. I mean, when you look at Revolut and Monzo, they they tend to be secondary or tertiary accounts rather than primary accounts. So where are you getting your your interest paid? I do, I do like you've given me an idea for Capron Asia, though. Maybe we should do um, to entice customers. We should do ten percent off the first fifty research projects that we uh, sell over the next six months. Uh, thank you, Matt, for for going through that on the incumbent banks. We we had some additional questions in the background that we'll answer after this. This was one of, definitely one of the more popular topics, but we'll we'll address those offline um, after the session. Um, coming, Joshua, back to you now. Um, NBFC lending, and uh, in particular in India and Southeast Asia, tell us a little bit more about what's happening on this. What what we mean by NBFC lending, and and where we see it going. So I think another term that people use for MBFC lending is the fintech lenders. Um, so they are basically targeting, um, providing these sort of micro loans, and it's usually using data analytics um, to address the, the people who were usually not able to address, uh, to get loans from traditional banks. And in the case of India, the MSMEs have become a huge target uh, for these fintech lenders, mainly because a lot of them have, um, have sort of a sustainable track record in terms of their uh, business sales and inventory, and they have been paying their supplies on time. But uh, for whatever reason, may, mainly because the revenue is too low or um, they're just not able to get loans from traditional banks. And this is where the fintech lenders have stepped in. Um, and really, you can see the, the huge um, interest as well from um, venture capital funds that have pumped money into uh, fintech lenders to try and gain a, a market share um, and capture the different niche areas uh, that, where they can address. So I think this uh, India is definitely going to be an area of a huge competition in, in the next few years uh, when it comes to fintech lending. And I think it'll be interesting to see uh, what sort of new credit products uh, come into play as um, the different lenders try and attract more, um, more of the MSMEs. And when we turn our attention to Southeast Asia, we see that um, this fintech lending is also gaining pace, but at a much, um, at a much lower rate compared to India. And I think well, one of the reasons for this is that um, in Asia, you have a more geographically um, spread out uh, continent. So, you know, in different areas, let's say in uh, Indonesia compared to Philippines, it's a, a different sort of approach um, that the lender has to take. And on top of that, you have really diverse um, cultural and regulatory environments in, in each of these different countries. So the, the hyper-localization within Southeast Asia makes it a lot harder for a fintech lender to sort of address the region as a whole. So they would need a, a multi-country strat strategy. Um, and all of that sort of just makes it a little bit more challenging for, for new entrants. So the fintech lenders in Southeast Asia tend to be um, just focused on their local market, which makes it, in a sense, um, a lot less, it's a lot smaller, uh, relatively speaking. Um, I think one thing that has also been on our radar quite a bit is the regulatory response uh, to these lenders in general across Asia. I think one of the big ones uh, was where um, uh, with the cancellation of Ant's IPO, which seemed to be in part because of uh, Ant wanting to, to dive more into lending, the lending business. Um, and I think there's a lot of concern whether a similar crackdown will happen in, in other countries in Southeast Asia. Um, but from what we have seen so far, I don't think that will be the case. Uh, for instance, if you look at Indonesia, which is one of the uh, the biggest markets in Southeast Asia for, for this sort of lending, uh, the OJ, OJK, which is their um, the financial authority there, they announced the tightening of regulations. And on the surface, uh, this seems to be um, a, a negative sign for fintech lending. But when you read more into the, the statement that they gave and the details they provided, um, ultimately, they still predicted a growth rate in lending and increase in amount of uh, lending that will happen over the next two, three years. So I think in, I'll take away from this is that um, the tightening of regulations is perhaps more of a, a superficial approach to give the, the impression um, that they are they'll be looking, watching out for uh, what, keeping an eye on the lenders, but ultimately you know, economic circumstances will take precedence in this case, uh, especially when you're dealing with a pandemic that has affected lots of businesses. 
Yeah, those are really good points. I mean, you, you think about the regulatory response in traditional times, and it seems to make a lot of sense, but in these pandemic times, it's a little bit more challenging. Um, Joshua, just one question on this. I mean, you, you mentioned uh, VCs. We've talked about Indonesia. Are there any kind of hidden gems in Southeast Asia? I mean, which countries should investors be looking at as uh, having the future of NBFC lending? Right. I think India, uh, sorry, Indonesia is definitely one of the largest markets there. Um, and I think the, the main rationale behind uh, investing in Indonesia is that any sort of uh, credit data gathered from um, from the users of MSMEs over there can be sort of applied to other countries in the region. Um, aside from Indonesia, I think Vietnam is actually one of the countries which is Often overlooked, um, but they have um, they have quite a liberal or accepting attitude towards um, fintech or even cryptocurrencies and, and lending. So that's an area where an um, investor who's looking to um, to dive into fintech lending will probably get more leeway um, and acceptance in uh, from economic standpoint as well as the regulatory standpoint. Great. Thanks, Joshua. Yeah, those are kind of like the, almost the second tier markets in Southeast Asia, but increasingly important markets. Great. Um, coming back to Matt, um, take a look at cross-border payments. I mean, that's that's a topic that we love to talk about because it's something that affects us as a business and, and, and consumers here in Asia. Tell us a little bit more about what we're going to see in 2021 in cross-border payments. So certainly, uh, the, uh, it, uh, the, the fintech disruptors will certainly be proactive uh, in 2021's and in um, we expect to see more intense competition, um, but flows will undulate. Uh, one area, um, and, and we do believe that those fintechs challenging or trying to certainly trying to challenge SWIFT to build alternative payment rails will, will continue to do so and, and look to form strategic partnerships when they can. Uh, looking at cross-border e-commerce, one of the fintech players who's been quite aggressive in this space uh, in, uh, globally, but increasingly in Asia, is Rapid. Um, they recently expanded into Korea, uh, South Korea, and uh, Thailand, and working with local partners. So we expect to see Rapid continue to make strides in, in that regard. Um, obviously, the biggest market uh, in Asia is China for cross-border e-commerce and certainly it will continue to grow. Uh, but there's a fintech crackdown going on that uh, we mentioned earlier that certainly was not happening uh, in years past. So what that could mean is that for those uh, fintechs, that are, or sorry, those payment firms that are looking for a way into the China market, it could become difficult in, in the short term. Uh, we saw, for instance, in 2020, TransferWise, uh, set up a partnership with Alipay, um, which allowed inbound flows uh, into, into China, not, not nothing outbound. Uh, that, that sort of partnership uh, in the long term, we expect uh, still, there's still potential, but as long as China's FinTech crackdown is going on, um, probably less opportunity for those kind of partnerships and uh, for foreign, certainly for foreign payment firms to, to tap the China market. Uh, looking at remittances, uh, that's been a, a growing area of cross-border payments in, in recent years, but because of the pandemic, we expect remittances will, will fall across Asia in 2021. Uh, in that, however, the, the, the three largest markets of uh, China and India and uh, the Philippines will, will remain the same, uh, but none of them, we expect none of them to grow uh, in, in 2021. One thing to keep in mind is the pandemic response in Indonesia uh, has, has not been the best in, in Southeast Asia and actually Malaysia and then Taiwan both uh, put bans on Indonesian migrants entering the country uh, in, in the fall of 2020 that, that remain in place uh, for the time being. So that, that certainly in the short term will affect remittances into Indonesia. And the, the sooner that Indonesia is able to get uh, the pandemic under control, um, the sooner uh, remittances can grow again in that market. However, in the long term, certainly we saw in late 2020, um, TransferWise announced you could send money from 80 countries, uh, sorry, to Indonesia, from Indonesia to 80 countries. Uh, and they were, uh, of course, uh, saying that it was at a rate two times cheaper than banks. So they're certainly one of the biggest players in the space and bullish on Indonesia in the long term. 
So these uh, certainly, but, but for the, the short term, uh, remittances will fall. Um, looking at the challenges to SWIFT, uh, Air Wallex has been one of the players that's been most aggressive in this space. And I'm, they mentioned uh, they're predicting now gross profits of, of 100 million uh, in 2021. Uh, we should keep in mind they didn't say net income. Um, and, and what happens when they subtract their costs and what, what the numbers will look like might, might be a little bit different than that. Um, and they'll be pushing into the U.S. market, uh, in, uh, they say, uh, in the first quarter of 2021. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is they are uh, affiliated with Tencent, Tencent invested and uh, headquartered in Hong Kong. So if Air Wallex were to become a large player uh, in the U.S., it might be on the the radar screen of U.S. regulators, uh, given given the U.S. U.S. China trade and tech tensions. Um, as far another interesting potential challenge to SWIFT could come from uh, the pay pay now and prompt pay. Um, of course, at, at Singapore uh, Singapore's recent fintech festival, uh, it was mentioned that uh, by mid year, registered users uh, will be able to send money uh, from either to and from Singapore and Thailand uh, just with, with a mobile number and banks will be the initial participants in that, but FinTechs uh, in the future should will, will likely be allowed to join. So that's another thing for SWIFT to keep in mind. However, we should not count SWIFT out. Uh, it's obviously a huge player in this space. It's processing much more um, you know, cross-border flows than any of these uh, FinTech upstarts. And we, we know that SWIFT certainly has um, talked about a two-year plan that it plans to implement uh, in which the company will transition from financial messaging uh, to more comprehensive uh, transaction management services. Um, and their goal, of course, is to, to speed things up because that's one of the, one of the complaints uh, from, from users and certainly those of us who've used uh, alternative payment rails to send money can, can vouch for the fact that, that it could be swift, uh, faster than the typical uh, bank transfer using SWIFT. Um, but once again, we need to keep in mind trust, uh, the trust that banks enjoy, the trust that SWIFT uh, certainly has, and that you know how many companies, uh, certainly on the corporate side, would be willing to use some of these alternative payment providers for, uh, for transfers that are in the millions. Of billions of U.S. dollars. Uh, that's something to keep in mind. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, just talking about SWIFT for a minute, and we've gotten um, a couple of questions about this in the in the background as you've been talking, Matt. Um, I mean, when we look at the recent SWIFT history, I mean, one of the big products, obviously, they've launched is GPI, and and one of the pushes for that was Ripple, and um, you know, its push into kind of being trying to move towards being a, the SWIFT replacement. Um, one of the things around Ripple is obviously the cryptocurrency or what they're calling on-demand liquidity, um, XRP. Uh, what The question that we have from the audience is, is what is the role of crypto, uh, cryptocurrencies and cross-border transactions in Asia? I mean, will we see, I mean, maybe you can talk just on the, the, the P2P cryptocurrency remittance side and then just more in general, uh, what it could mean for business-to-business uh, -business or uh, consumer-to-business transfers within Asia? Well, I think it's certainly it's certainly a growing a growing area, uh, but we need to look at you know to what degree has it has it been accepted by by regulators by central banks into the the mainstream financial system. Uh, you know, certainly um, we'll talk about that CBDCs uh, a little bit later. Uh, China is certainly moving in that direction, but it, it doesn't seem at this point uh, that that, crypt, that crypto is going to be uh, is going to pose a challenge uh, to to existing flows. Uh, not 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 at this point. Yeah, yeah, I think it'll be a while before we see that. But with the rise of the price of Bitcoin over the past month, that's been um getting certainly a lot it's more attention. It's certainly something to watch. It's just that, uh, it, as, as we've seen with Libra, uh, for instance, a lot of hype around Libra at the beginning. And uh, then we had we had some big players that, that had signed on to the project that then withdrew without stating specific reasons why. Uh, I, I think it's really going to be central banks and, and regulators that have to go forward and, and adopt, fully adopt crypto. Uh, virtual currency to to allow it to to become central to to cross-border payment yeah. flow 
as long as that's not the case, uh, certainly it can play a role, but not not a paramount one. Yeah, yeah, all good points. Great, thank you, Matt. Um, Lele, I want to come back to you and 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 potentially, you know, it, it beyond the price of Bitcoin, one of the topics that's been gaining a lot of um, attention over the past couple months is obviously everything that's happened with Ant Group, the postponed uh, indefinitely IPO. Um, you know, we we've seen this tech fin to fintech uh, transition. Can you shed a little bit more light on what's happening around regulation in China around fintech and what that means going forward? Sure, thanks, Simon. So we've been mentioning Ant Group uh, many times all through the whole webinar, as definitely it is a, a very big representative of the tech thing of fintech industry in China. So um, the, uh, the the fintech uh, fintech became tech thing according to Ant Group in a few years ago, as they claim that they are going to provide financial technologies to support financial services instead of they are doing financial services themselves. There was like a relatively clear line between technology support and financial services at that time when they started promoting themselves as such, along with all other FinTech platforms, as they think that if they provide technologies or the uh, clients access to the financial institutions such as banks or internet loan companies, they should be uh, considered as a technology provider instead of a financial service provider. This idea was brought by AND and also in the following years, they tried to conduct them, but the line between technology support and financial service became more and more unclear. For example, in a joint lending uh, model between FinTech and a bank, the FinTech platform would perform in every process of the whole uh, loan insurance. For example, from acquiring the clients and conducting the risk control uh, analysis, uh, issuing the loans after, after loan maintenance and also reporting to the financial institutions about the results, a FinTech platform or texting platform actually pay, uh, are involved in every part of the whole process. On the other side, banks are involved in providing the cap most of the capitals, conducting internal risk control process as required by the regulators and collecting interest as well as paying those platforms certain fees as a service fee. Indeed, when we look at those business behaviors, both banks and the companies are doing what a banking would be doing, a financial services, instead of a pure technology services, according to, uh, as claimed to these platforms. So as they grow bigger and bigger, actually dur during the uh, development of their business, the, regulator, the regulators held a wait and see attitude to encourage innovation as services to SMEs and individuals were actually blank in China for many years. But the caps of P2P lending and the growing uh, uh, potential risk from the lending business of uh, from and or other uh, companies actually brought uh, concerns to these regulators. As we can see that in 2017, the regulators have started shutting down all the P2P lendings because of the high risk and no regulation. And we can, after after the Jack Bass speech at the band, band the IPO got, uh, and IPO got pulled and the regulators launched a new uh, draft policy um, tighten the micro lending business to those internet loan companies and they try to control the risk which generated a big change in the regulation environment for the financial uh, for the financial uh, industry and these fintech companies and later the regulators rectify those companies to uh, to, uh, to to return back to their original business so they either going to be doing financial services and get regulated as financial institutions, 
or they can stay closer to the TechLink idea, which means they provide technology support to the financial banks instead of getting involved in any part of the financial services and become a financial service provider. So as for and as uh, we uh, we discussed that before in the Q and A, but to uh, to uh, from our opinion, so it will either become a tech thing or a fintech. So being a tech thing would be uh, would definitely shrinking their would definitely shrink their business as they are not going to be involved in financial services as directly as before and they provide technology support. If they want to stick to the fintech idea, which means they will need to set up a separate business body to run all those financial related services such as wealth management and lending, uh, uh, invest, uh, uh, investment and such products so they will face regulations like banks which would have higher requirements on the capital requirements on their risk control process on their reporting process what is more uh, from these uh, requirements of the fintech platforms the sme incumbents would get affected too like before they work with end group they can easily access the customers from every corner of the nation but in the future if they started uh, if if they changed their business for sme banks there would be challenges in front of like how do they access uh customers from other parts of the province how do they control their risk without the support from these uh, technology groups and if they are going to compete with the big income uh, income bill, uh, incumbents how are they gonna win them by uh, earning more reputation and earning more clients the the previous cooperation definitely helped them a lot in developing their business but these are the challenges of west uh, of west for this sme incumbents to solve thanks yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, I, I remember that transition when it was initially FinTech and then, you know, Ant Group did quite a bit of PR a couple of years ago to, to really stress the tech fin aspect of things. And, and some of that is most obvious. I mean, if you look at uh, Lou Fax's financial records, if you look at kind of 2017, about 20 to 30 percent of the loans were on Lufax's books, and that dropped to two to three percent uh, in 2019 in the first part of 2020. So they really, it's interesting because our, our impression, and this is potentially something that we actually got wrong in our trends a couple of years ago, was that the government was really pushing them to move from this fintech to tech fin model. But it appears now that they almost want them to go back to the fintech model and take more risk on their own books. Um, Lele, just, just a question for you. Um, I mean, in my mind, and and this this sounds like, a, I mean, Ant Financial is obviously a client of ours, but we do kind of believe in some of the business models that they have in place. I mean, they've done so much for bringing people into the financial ecosystem, and we've written about this in reports previously. Uh, you know, what prompted the government to to weigh that balance? Because it seems like in that wait and see time, um, the benefits far outweighed any of the risks. But now we're getting to the point where the government seems to think that the risks outweigh the benefits. And, and so one of the challenges in this is that, you know, the literally millions of SMEs and individuals that have relied on these digital platforms like Ant Group and Lufax for lending may have to go back to traditional channels or uh, less legal forms of borrowing money. I mean, what, what do you think prompted that change and, and how has that affected how the government thinks about some of these platforms? So definitely the business itself has potential risk as, uh, well, before there was just no, uh, or like near, nearly zero services for individuals or SMEs to conduct, to get loans when they need to. So the stepping in from these fintech platforms along with their cooperation with other banks actually did good for SMEs or individuals to get like, certain like consumer loans or business loans to develop their own business or fulfill their needs when necessary. Um, it's just for after years of development and after years of the leverage, the 
uh, fintech platforms has developed, the government realized that if the there is some crack, I um I don't mean that there definitely will be, but just possibly if that happens, there would be a big like risk to the financial industry. And because these platforms only take like one or two percent of the total capital, all the risk will be left to the banks and the bank's risk would definitely lead to the loss of the residents because they deposit money to the banks. So to avoid such big risk and at this moment, there's also some unwise ideas about do young people really consume too much or too ahead of time? To, so I think from the two sides, the financial risk and to help people to establish a more reasonable attitude to consumption, the government decided that here now is the time to step in and get everything to a better track. Great, thanks, Lele. Um, we're we're only through seventy of these trends. We've got three more left, but I think in uh, we're we're hitting the end of the time we have for this webinar. So. Um, We'll, we'll pause it here and then, uh, you know, please do we encourage you to uh, download the report when it's available. Again, everybody who's registered for the webinar will send you a note about how to access that. Please as well, feel free to reach out to any one of us um, about anything that we talked about today, any follow-up questions you had. We, def we had some comments and questions in the background that we didn't have a chance to answer, uh, but we will come back and, and answer those in due course. Um, thank you so much for attending today. Thank you as well to um, our other panelists and coworkers here at Capron Asia. We're pleased to you know, bring this trends report to you again for, again, the 10th year that we've been doing this. Uh, it will be available in the next week. I hope you found the content today very valuable. And uh, we look forward to speaking to you again and seeing you soon on another Capron Asia webinar. Thank you.